Can I welcome everyone to the 14th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The second item of business is a session on the Enterprise and Skills Review, and I welcome to the meeting Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work, Hugh McAloon, Head of Youth Employment, and Paul Smart, Head of Colleges, Young Workforce and SFC Sponsorship Division in the Scottish Government. I understand the Cabinet Secretary wishes to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. I will be brief. Uh, just first of all to thank the uh, Committee for the invitation to come and speak here today on the Enterprise and Skills Review and in particular the impact of that review on the two agencies involved, uh, SDS and the Scottish Funding Council. As you'll know, the First Minister announced the review on the 25th of May and that it would cover the work of the Scottish Government and four of its agencies, Scottish Enterprise, including SDI, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, SDS and SFC. The Phase 1 decisions of the Enterprise and Skills Review were published by me on the 25th of October. Uh, the aim was to take fresh action towards our long-term ambition encapsulated in Scotland's econo economic strategy. Uh, that was to rank in the top quartile of OECD countries for productivity, equality, well-being and sustainability. Uh, and that ambition, ambition was the foundation for the work of our four enterprise and skills agencies, both individually and together with each other and the Scottish Government. Uh, we recognise the vital contribution the four agencies make to creating a more successful country with opportunities for all of Scotland to flourish through delivering inclusive and sustainable economic growth. Our agencies and their staff already carry out excellent work with a diverse range of partners around Scotland and, as Audit Scotland noted, they have been successful in their respective roles with clear strategies and good governance. Uh, the enterprise agencies, for example, collectively work with or assist around 11,200 businesses each year, and there are good examples of all of them working with partners to achieve a positive impact, such as creating jobs. Uh, while the review has been undertaken in the context, of course, of post-recession uh, public sector expenditure, and we have all been looking closely at opportunities for savings uh, and investment which will deliver the greatest return, the primary purpose of the review is about identifying ways in which we can strengthen the support on offer and the economic outcomes it delivers. Uh, that's why we aim to establish an overarching single board which will allow us to strategically position our agencies and effectively align the services they deliver. Uh, we are alert to the stakeholders' concerns about the process of closer alignment between the agencies and the creation of a single board, and in particular those concerns expressed by the university, uh, university sector. So a key focus of phase two of the review will be to work very closely with the public bodies and the stakeholders to ensure that the new structures enable a more integrated approach to enterprise and skill support, while maintaining distinctive approaches where appropriate. And I'd want to emphasise that the autonomy of universities will be protected and that I do, of course, recognise the value of arm's length bodies advising ministers uh, about matters across both the F and HE sectors. We are alert to stakeholders' concerns about the process of closer alignment between the agencies and the creation of a single board, in particular those of the university sector. So we will work very closely with the bodies. They will be uh, integral to the next stage of the review. And I'd want to emphasise that the autonomy and the academic freedom of universities will be protected uh, and that we recognise the uh, integrity of that uh, currently and that it will be protected as we go forward. So, with those comments, uh, Convener, I'm uh, happy to try and answer any questions the committee may have. Thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you ran the formal call for evidence between 15th of July and 15th of August. Uh, how confident is the Scottish Government that the views heard during that relatively short consultation period are representative of the various people and organisations with an interest in or are served by Enterprise and Skills Agency? Uh, well, we had a very substantial response, over 300 responses uh, during the course of that period, 329 responses, and that was from a very broad spread of interested parties. Um, and, of course, the review itself is not finished yet. We have phase two of that review, and the uh, level of involvement uh, is still very substantial across the sector and from stakeholders um, in the area. So, for example, the... What's different from phase one is that the bodies themselves, the four agencies, will have representation on the ministerial review group. Uh, we also have under active consideration the possibility of a transitional body, which will include the agencies themselves for 
uh, three different reasons. One, really, to provide the reassurance to the agencies about the central uh, nature of their involvement in the process going forward, and to reassure the staff that are there as well. Secondly, there will be decisions that are required to be taken, of course, over the course of uh, the, the remainder of the review. Those decisions properly rest with the agencies. Um, but they will want to coordinate those where they can to achieve that alignment, which I've previously mentioned, um, and also to provide support to the, um, uh, the ministerial review group in terms of the uh, work that they'll be doing. There's a, a substantial number of work streams. So I think that level of stakeholder engagement uh, is extensive. And it's uh, involved those people with the greatest interest in relation to that. So uh, we also have, uh, as I say, a serious, quite a large number of uh, work streams going forward from the Ministerial Review Group, and it'll be open them to take on board other expertise as we go forward. So I think the engagement has been both uh, widespread and substantial. Thanks for that. Uh, uh, in the consultation responses, there uh, was uh, talk of a cluttered landscape, difficult access support, tension between national and regional approaches and a lack of partnership working. Can you give us some details of the specific focus of activity and actions being pursued through the second phase of the review, which might help to deal with, with some of these issues? Yeah, as I say, we have a number, uh, quite a, a large number of um, areas that we're looking at. Perhaps the first and most important of those is the issue of governance. And I mentioned in the opening statement about the concerns uh, that have been expressed in relation to the university sector in particular. Uh, also in relation to uh, HIE. Um, so a very uh, substantial piece of work being done on governance as to how we make sure that we recognise the strengths and the requirements of those sectors um, in terms of the new governance structure which is built around the new overarching board. So that's one area. Uh, another area which is interesting, I'm sure, to members is the idea of uh, regionalisation. So COSLA have been involved in this uh, ministerial review group at a high level from the start um, and have been very helpful, in fact, in recent uh, weeks in saying that as we move forward into phase two, they are willing to consider or allow to be considered the current functions which they carry out in relation to business gateway and economic development to be considered alongside our um, ongoing work for, say, skills development, how that might be uh, delivered on a regional basis around the country. So that may well result in um, much closer collaboration right the way through the different economic development functions and skills functions of different bodies, and of course may result in additional um, uh, autonomy for bodies across Scotland and Highlands and Islands in the south of Scotland as well. So you have the governance, you have regionalisation, um, you also have separate streams in relation to, um, I suppose, what's called uh, decluttering. We're aware that there are a substantial number of initiatives and uh, different bodies, um, so we've asked for work to be undertaken which recognises um, there's only so many people that can service all of those initiatives and those bodies, and if it's the case that we find that there are uh, overlapping or any duplication, we should be looking to make sure that we can eradicate that to be more effective. Um, so those are three that I can mention off the top of my head. I don't know if Paul or Hugh want to mention any of the other work streams which you have ongoing. Maybe not. Um, yeah, there are, there are several um, based on the decisions that came out of the first phase of the review. As uh, the Cabinet Secretary has already mentioned, a, a stronger governance at the top there with an overarching strategic board. But in addition to that, a, a proper look at national and local enterprise skills delivery um, in a much more coordinated way. So. Um, facing up to the observation from a number of evidence givers that it was a cluttered landscape. I think it was as cluttered in terms of um, saying, well, how can they be better aligned to deliver their services? Um, looking at um, a better international coordination of activity to, to respond to the um, opportunities in, in international markets. Um, simplifying the innovation to support ecosystems, so looking at, at the whole way in which innovation is promoted by the range of agencies that are already engaged in that, um, looking at aligning the functions of learning and skills agencies, principally Scottish Funding Council and Skills Development Scotland, um, looking thoroughly at the learner journey, the, the 15 to 24 year old journey um, through the, the education and skills development systems um, and review, which is fundamental actually, review the effectiveness of investment in learning and skills as well where I think there is a number of um, evidence given during the phase one that, that we needed to be much more uh, effective at measuring the impact and outcomes of our interventions. 
I think it's worth also mentioning, Convener, that uh, uh, digital is another work stream, but these work streams uh, were just in the process of having heard the first ministerial review group since uh, the end of phase one, so the start of phase two, of writing out to members of the ministerial review group to see which areas they want to see taken forward and which they individually want to be involved in, so that's under active discussion. But digital is another area where we intend to see a, a, a very fundamental work stream as to how we move forward in that area as well. Yeah, thank you. Joanne? Uh, thanks very much. I think already we've been able to see just how substantial and significant this work is. Massive, involves huge numbers of people in really important roles. I wonder what prompted you to have a review that only lasted a month during the summer holidays? Uh, well, the review lasted substantially longer than that. I think you're referring to the consultation period, but the review lasted longer than that. Um, and what prompted us to do that, I think, as I said in my opening statement, that... Um, we have to recognise that the ambition that we had, and I think it was true of previous governments as well, to move Scotland from that third quartile in terms of economic performance, and that relates obviously to things like competitiveness, productivity, um, internationalisation. We hadn't achieved what we had sought to achieve, and if you're not achieving that, then it seems right and proper to me that we do, as the First Minister announced, review those agencies which are most central um, to that. So that was the prompt for it, but it was also the case that whether in the uh, parliaments, in the chamber or in its committees, there has been um, concern expressed over previous years about whether there's duplication. Um, I think it's also true to say that we felt very strongly that the agencies themselves could very much justify the work they were doing and they could point to the successes they'd had, sometimes very substantial uh, successes. But it wasn't the case that we saw that uh, alignment of the agencies across uh, each other so that you had, for example, in terms of international activity, that level of focus. So um, in previous years, I remember a, a, a minister going to China to promote uh, both Scotland and the university sector with a Scottish university. And I think two, maybe three other universities turned up on the day because they were worried about missing out. And I think whether it's that or whether it's in relation to some of the work we do through SDI, um, we've got some very substantial presences around the world with universities as well. I think we want to be selling Scotland as a whole and we have to coordinate our activities more substantially. So that was the, the prompt for doing that. And of course, it's not the case the reviews lasted uh, for a month. The review is still ongoing. We're still in the review uh, with some months to go before it's concluded. So the consultation lasted a month. Over yeah, the summer you, holidays. Yeah, but I think you said the review lasted right, a month. Well, I'm now saying, saying the consultation yeah. lasted for a month over the summer holidays. Are there any other examples in your time in government where you've consulted over a month in the summer over something as substantial as this? Well, given that I think most of my time in government I've had a particular focus, I can only talk about the areas that I've been involved in, so I couldn't answer the question about other consultations. You'd find out if there are any examples of Scottish government consultations that last a month over the summer. Can you ask if in any of the responses in the consultation, did anybody suggest the need for an overarching board? And I'm not saying people didn't say there was a cluttered landscape, they didn't say there were problems. Which of the people who responded identified that as the solution? Well, I, I could mention a number of individuals within the Ministerial Review Group who represent bodies that responded to it, who also voiced support for that idea. So, Asked. Well, but, it's one thing to say you voice support for a proposal that comes before you, did anybody come to the consultation and say, you know what, we think the solution to this is to have an overarching board? It may not be what you asked, but that's what I'm answering. I'm telling you there are people in the Ministerial Review Group who never had a proposal in front of them, but came forward saying they supported the yeah. idea of a single overarching board. They represented bodies which were consulted, and that's what their view okay. was. So the government makes for a proposal, and people, in some oh. case, agree with it. Of the four uh, boards, you see, the four agencies were represented. Mm. They're able to, be, they're going to be part of, as this goes forward. Do they have the freedom to speak out against government policy if they think it's going to be damaging publicly? Yeah, can you just say that, again, your first statement was incorrect. I didn't say there was a proposal from the government that people then agreed with. I'm saying people came back from the consultation as part of the consultation and made that point. It's an important distinction to make. No, sorry, I'm not clear what the distinction yeah. is. Well, you, you, you've said, I think, twice now that we made a proposal which then people could choose to agree with. I'm saying that's not what happened. There was no proposal during the course of the Ministerial Review Group. People came forward voluntarily and said that they thought a single overarching board was a good idea which, within that Ministerial who Review said Group. said that? Well, we had that's it in the context of the Ministerial which Review Group. Which organisations well, came forward well, they, um, independently and said, 
They believed, not that they agreed with the government's proposal, they independently believed that this, in fact, they brought this proposal onto the table that there should be an overarching board. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's probably invidious to mention people involved in the Ministerial Review Group, but the College of Scotland were one example, but others can be seen from a, a perusal of the uh, consultation responses, which are all publicly available. Okay. Uh, and there was a second part to your question, if you could just remind me what that was. I'm interested in that you've said that the agencies are involved yeah. have going to be part of this group and they're going to have the freedom to uh, contribute to what happens next. Do they have the freedom to speak publicly about the implications of the proposals for an overarching board? Because I think that would give people some comfort. You know you will be aware that we had a conversation with the Scottish uh, Funding Council about the fact they give advice privately to ministers but would not make that public. Are they able to speak publicly about these proposals and implications they believe for the economy and for skills? No uh, order that people can't speak publicly. In fact, one of the members of the review group would be at University of Scotland, who have spoken very public, have voiced their concerns. So uh, people, of course, and, and that's the purpose of the ministerial review group. The idea was to have people most involved in the sector that can actually give advice straightforwardly to government. And of course, uh, some of them have chosen to make that public, and that's their right to do so. Be, is it, I'm interested to know to what extent the Scottish government itself is an open mind in this. Is it possible, given what um, Mr Swinney has said about this, and it would appear to have said that things have already been decided, is it possible at the end of this process the Scottish Government decides that, in fact, um, an overarching board would be overly bureaucratic, would not be able to deal with regional difference and so on, and may actually not pursue that proposal? Or is that something that's been decided that should happen through the second stage? Uh, it has been decided, and we wouldn't have decided it if it, we thought it was going to be overly bureaucratic. That wasn't the idea behind it. In fact, it's one way of helping to uh, achieve the alignment which I mentioned and decluttering uh, the system. So that, yes, we have decided, and what I've said is now being looked at by not just the original members of the Ministerial Review Group, but now involving all the members of those uh, bodies, is the governance structure around that. So we have a very open mind as to that. And of course, that's the area in which both, for example, um, a, a University of Scotland, uh, the Funding Council, uh, I'm sure will be very involved in the governance process to make sure the concerns which they've expressed are dealt with in terms of the governance structure. So you've started with your own proposal, and this stage two is now to is the responsibility of people to make it work. It's how that process is carried out, rather than the issue of the, the principle of this overarching board. No, we didn't, again, for, I think for the third time. We didn't start with the proposal. We started with the review. We had a ministerial review group. We had a consultation which led us to the proposal for the single overarching board. We're now going into the process, second uh, phase of the process, where the governance structure uh, of that board is what will be examined. And we do have an open mind that I've assured the members of that board that that's the case. They will lead in relation to how we take forward the governance structure. Uh, so it's an open process. They have the chance to influence it and to make sure the concerns which they have are expressed by what we eventually agree. But for the absence of doubt, there will be an overarching board? Yes. OK, thank you. OK, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, thank you. Can I just uh, follow up, Cabinet Secretary, on uh, the questions that Joanne Lamont has asked? And uh, can I refer you to the comments that have been made by the Royal Society of Edinburgh? Uh, who have no problem about uh, the need for a better uh, industrial and research and innovation uh, strategy, none at all. But they do raise uh, two very specific issues, uh, one of which is exactly uh, akin to what Joanne Lamont was asking, where they say that uh, the phase one report indicates that phase two of the review will be about the implementation of the conclusions, with there having been very little parliamentary scrutiny to date, as to whether these conclusions are well founded. The second point they make is they say that the Royal Society notes that the publication report one of, uh, in phase one, but is concerned that it does not present a strong evidence base for the approach that the Scottish Government proposes to take in establishing this new statutory board. Could you tell us, in your view, where you think the evidence is, where is the clear evidence that what you are proposing, and you've just indicated that it is firm proposals that will go ahead, where is the evidence to support this plan? Uh, well, I think both in terms of what we did produce um, and actually reported on to Parliament, we had a debate on it in Parliament. Uh, so the conclusions that we have reached as part of phase one are backed up by the evidence which was published at that time. I've given you the rationale for us undertaking the review in the first place in terms of what we have not achieved, which you now want to achieve. We've had the involvement of all the different stakeholders uh, and a very active consideration by 
the people on the ministerial review group who represent, um, for example, University Scotland, they, they represent the college sector, they represent businesses. A business is also very um, seized of the view that we should, going back to the previous point, have undertaken this as quickly as possible. I should add that um, perhaps the pace of, at which this is being carried out is also uh, underlined by the new environment in which we find ourselves in terms of Brexit. There was expressed by a number of people the need for urgency to do this because of a very uh, rapidly changing situation in terms of Brexit, which obviously impacts in terms of international activity. Um, so uh, we have uh, that background. And as you say, the Royal Society have mentioned those things that have actually been quite supportive in terms of some of the uh, proposals. But I suppose the other point to make is we haven't finished this review yet. We've come to some conclusions, but as to how those are fleshed out over the course um, of the whole review, which of course will then result uh, by all means, uh, by most estimations in a further parliamentary process and indeed a legislative process. Um, again, there's a further opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny then. So whether individual members want to look at the evidence base for what we're doing at that time, it's, it's up that they can see what we've produced so far. They'll see further evidence of that when we come to the conclusion of phase two and they can take their, their own view on that. And it will be interesting, I think, to see from the Royal Society and others who've commented uh, their view once we've reached uh, conclusions uh, after phase two of the report. But I don't know whether Paul wants to add to that point. Well, at the same time as call for evidence, that we, we commissioned um, a number of academics to look at international comparisons to see how they shaped up against our own perspective. So we had Professor Alan McGregor uh, look at operations in places like Denmark, Norway, Northern Ireland, uh, New Zealand, um, where there was clear evidence of a, of a more joined up and coordinated approach seems in terms of um, ensuring that we, we provide a, a coherent approach to the development of skills and learning. So uh, that was coupled with a report from Dr. David Skilling as well, um, looking at international business support as well. So that fed into, obviously, the consideration of the decisions and recommendations that came out of phase one. Uh, what did you just one of the key pieces of evidence was uh, in uh, the skilling report uh, in relation to HE, so we topped the league in terms of people going through HE, but given what I said earlier on about economic performance and productivity, we haven't had the dividends you might have expected from that level of investment. So one of the conclusions in one of those reports was that uh, it may be the case that uh, investment in uh, more uh, essential basic skills than those delivered at HE could provide a bigger economic impact. So uh, both of those reports were things which the whole ministerial review group considered uh, in the process of the first part of the review. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I, I don't think there's any uh, disagreement about the need for uh, a strategy. I, th I think that's very clear, in fact, of all the submissions that I've read. And indeed, the, the parliamentary debate that took place was very much about some of the issues that you've set out uh, here and what can be done about that. I think the real concern, however, is what evidence do you have to ensure that the, the new board, the overarching board, which will abolish, as I understand it, the existing boards and have a new board, and which, if your answer to Joanne Lamont is accurate, you are suggesting will happen. What is the evidence on which you are basing that decision that it will work better when we have a lot of the institutions involved who are raising pretty serious concerns about the abolition of some of these boards? And I know some of my colleagues will come back to this uh, a bit later on. What's the evidence that it is going to work better? Because I quite frankly can't see it. Well, the evidence, as I've said, we uh, produced a substantial amount of that at the time of the part one conclusions. But I mean, the other evidence that we took, for example, was from people that are currently being um, if you like, provided with services from either Highlands and Islands Enterprise or either account managed com uh, uh, companies. We took evidence from those that are using the services of Skills Development Scotland just now. I was very keen at the start of the process that we actually had the evidence from people receiving those services. Uh, and those led us to the picture that there was elements of duplication, um, that there was not the level of joint working that we wanted to see happen, I've mentioned in relation to international activities. Um, and uh, I have to say, to some extent, that was reinforced by some of the uh, contributions from people from the agencies themselves. Um, so, you know, whether, for example, HIE currently get the level of service they require in terms of 
international activity through SDI, um, whether there's a level of collaboration there should be between universities when they're acting overseas and SDI and other elements of government as well. So we, had to, we took a substantial amount of evidence. We have produced that evidence so far and we'll produce further evidence as we go through phase two for the conclusions then. Could, could you clarify something, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, my understanding is that the Scottish Funding Council board as it exists just now would no longer be in existence and there would be a new overarching board. If you abolish the current Funding Council board, you effectively abolish the Scottish Funding Council because they are one and the same thing. Is that uh, what you intend to do? Uh, well, we've said what we've said in terms of the existing boards, but you're right to suggest that there's still an open question as to what function, what... Uh, what should be the form of the governance structure which applies in relation to the Funding Council, in particular to the universities. So, as I've said, what we have is a piece of work being undertaken in terms of the governance structure, which will look at those issues. We'll come back to how that is best serviced, and you've heard some of the concerns in relation to ensuring academic freedom is preserved, ensuring that ministers are not able to take certain decisions, it should be at one um, removed from ministers. So those things are actively, actively being considered, and they will involve both the Funding Council and University of Scotland being involved in those considerations. But we've not reached the stage of reaching a conclusion on that yet. Right, so there are obviously some conclusions, but there are other conclusions that don't exist. In other words, you are categorically saying this morning that you have not made a decision about the governance structure of this new board. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. We made that clear in the, uh, the debate. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, and then Tavish. Um, I just want to ask one question under this theme and come back to HIE, if that's okay, in a short while when we turn to that issue. Uh, as someone who's been in Parliament since 1999, I've had a pound for every time politicians across all the parties call for a bonfire of the quangles or for the public sector landscape to be streamlined, I'd be a very rich man. So I very much understand where the government are coming from and, and what the government's trying to achieve and support much of, of that agenda. I'd just like to comment on where regional policy sits in terms of where we're going with this review, because there's a number of initiatives happening across Scotland, and I just want to understand better how regional policy has been delivered. So you have this review, you have city-region deals, and a number, a number of other initiatives. So, but the city region deals tend to be focused on the cities. And I'd like to explain what the difference is between a city, city's policy and a regional policy in Scotland, because my fear is that we may have a national approach in some respects and a city approach in other respects, and all the areas in between uh, fall through the net. So I just would wonder if you can expand on how the government's trying to deliver regional policy in Scotland. Yeah, I would say that um, you're quite correct in relation to the, um, I would have described it, the unique nature of the city deal framework which is emerging. Of course, that was an initiative which began uh, in the Glasgow region uh, with ourselves, the UK government and the relevant local authorities proposing that. And the one thing I would say in relation to city deals, I think you're right to say they don't fit readily into the current structures that we have. And I think for that reason, it's quite right to look at those structures again. Um, but I think it's also true to say that uh, a feature of city deals which do involve much more than the cities because of the uh, nature of the uh, deal. So Aberdeen involves Aberdeenshire, um, a number of authorities which are not cities involved in the Glasgow deal. Uh, Stirling uh, involves club manager, obviously not a city. Uh, the Tay Cities deal, despite its... Um, its uh, title will involve more than cities as well. So they do involve more than cities, but I understand your point about how does that fit currently with uh, regional policy. I think the one thing I'd say I'm uh, keen that we, in phase two, which when, when, is when we'll examine this in more detail, is to preserve that, because I think the benefit of those is these have been, if you like, organically grown through local authorities. In each of the deals that we have, the projects and initiatives that ourselves and the UK government are funding are ones which local authorities themselves have said they want, and I think there's something vitally important about that. So we want to maintain those, and of course our stated aim is to further... Um, and look with um, encouragingly on those deals which are still to emerge. So Tay Cities has been mentioned, Edinburgh has been mentioned, and the Stirling and Club Manager deals, which I think, if I'm right, will take all of the cities in Scotland, but much more than that. Beyond that, I think that we are looking at terms of regionalisation, and one of the conclusions of the first phase of the review was to establish a new South of Scotland agency to look uh, in particular uh, at that area because of some of the views that we'd had expressed, uh, some of the evidence that had been led to us in terms of concerns people had felt there. Perhaps the most 
Uh, frequently expressed anecdote was, if you look at the respective trajectories of Inverness and Dumfries over a number of years, Inverness has done very well. Dumfries, these people said, less so, and how can we have that focus in terms of south of Scotland? So, uh, and as I say, the, the issue of regionalisation is something that's one of the work streams that's being developed uh, just now. For my part, I don't think we should be too rigid in how that develops. I think, as I've mentioned, City Deal, there is something very important about the fact that this is developed from local authorities themselves. So whether it's the nature of the, the, the geographical areas which are covered by different initiatives, or whether it's in the nature of what services are provided, um, I think we have a, a relatively uh, open mind as we go through phase two. So whether, you know, I'm not suggesting this is what's going to happen, but if a proposal comes forward that we should look at skills and some of the functions of local authorities being delivered in a different way from one area to another, then I think that's something we should look at. So it's not um, tidy and clean. Uh, I'm happy to concede that, but I do think not least in relation to city deals or something organic and vital about the way that we're providing these services. Okay. I mean, my only, if I can just make a very quick comment, is that I'd urge ministers to, to look at this a bit more closely because we have this review, but we've got various other initiatives as well. And I need to, and I'm sure Parliament wants to be confident, that's delivering a proper regional policy, which is not just the skills and enterprise review doing one thing and then looking at the cities as a way of addressing some of the other issues but the rest of Scotland falls through the net, and I think there's a real danger of that happening if we don't think through what regional policy in Scotland looks like, and particularly learn from other countries. I would just say, in relation to the cities review, it's worth bearing in mind, though, if you were to look at the seven cities of Scotland and the likely deals which will emerge in relation to them, the area covered by those which are not cities will vastly exceed the areas which are covered by the cities, given the way that the city deals are configured. Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen. Inverness um, is, uh, is the only one which stands alone for, uh, I think, fairly obvious reasons. But again, in Glasgow, with the seven or eight other authorities involved in that, which are not cities, so the area covered by the city deals is very substantially greater than the cities themselves, but I take the point that you make. Yeah. You will I'll come back in each we'll jump. Go ahead then. Is each now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, in terms of the, the review, as I said before, I understand where the, the government's uh, trying to get to in terms of addressing the public sector landscape. But Jim Hunter, the Highlands historian and former chairman of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, of course, wrote a scathing article about the decision to uh, disband the Highlands and Islands Enterprise Board. And I think, therefore, it would be good to hear what comfort you can give Jim Hunter and other people in Highlands and Islands who have expressed concern uh, over that decision, because uh, clearly people want to know how Helens and Ellen's interests are going to be represented in the overarching framework. Yeah, I think uh, what we've said, both going back to the debate that we held in Parliament on that, is that Highlands and Islands um, enterprise itself will remain. It will remain as a, a legal entity. Uh, they will remain with a chief executive based in Inverness, with the headquarters based in Inverness. The same people that are currently providing the services to individuals and to companies in the Highlands and Islands will be providing those same services to those same companies and hopefully uh, many more. Um, and, and that was something that came back to us in the evidence. Uh, people said that they valued uh, those services. In relation to the board, I think it's important that we um, await the outcome of the governance initiatives which I've mentioned previously. So for phase two of the report, um, to see how those things, which some people like Jim Hunter have been talked about, uh, are further um, preserved and uh, ensured in terms of the continuation after that governance um, uh, review. And just to mention that Highlands and Islands Enterprise, of course, will be intrinsically involved in that governance review as well. So, and I, I think the other thing to say is that the initiative here, going back to a previous question, was the extent to which bodies can get the support and work actively with other public bodies to achieve um, more. So if you look at, for example, many of the initiatives in the Highlands in recent years, um, uh, the Mistorloch Bypass, to mention the local one, but the A9, uh, we're the first government to commit to duelling the A9, the first government to commit to duelling the A96. We have struck a city deal for Inverness. The recent work done by my colleague Fergus Ewing in terms of the Rio Tinto um, a, a development, um, further development uh, in Fort William, whereby 130 plus jobs have been safeguarded with the prospect of many more. These things have often been achieved either not through HIE 
or through HIE working with other bodies. And we want to try and maximise our ability to do that in future. And in relation, in relation specifically to HIE, I think their ability to work on an international basis, I think, is very important. SE and SDI have a particular relationship, obviously, but I don't think we've had sufficiently the uh, ability to prosecute those interests of HIE on the international stage in the way that I like to see happen. So whether it's through universities um, uh, or whether it's through SDI, I think we want to maximise the international opportunities that are there as well. So I think we'll have something greater than what we have just now as a result of these changes. And in terms of the governance, uh, people should take a view on that once they see exactly what's proposed in relation to Highlands and Islands. Okay. Well, just to, just to close, I just say that I think it's important that ministers keep an open mind in terms of listening closely to the concerns being expressed in the Highlands and Islands in terms of how we address those concerns. Tavish. I can ask if the Chairman of Highlands and Islands Enterprise is allowed to say publicly what his views are on the abolition of his board? Tavish Scott will know as well as I the um, a code of conduct for people appointed to government bodies, but there's been no injunction on law and career not to speak out. In fact, I think he's spoken out a number of occasions in relation to this. Well, he told uh, Highlands and MSPs last night he wasn't. He wasn't uh, going to speak out I publicly. Can't really comment on third party conversations, convener. Uh, could you give me a practical example of what you just said to Richard Lockhead, which is where STI have not been servicing high properly? Well, I think if you look at the evidence, I think it were, they were said that um, there was a, a narrow base, I think it came up during the course of the Ministerial Review Group, that that level of support from SDI could be greater. We've had that expressed to us. Um, but it, example, just to help well, you, can't, you can't give an example of investment that didn't happen. Um, so I think that's... Uh, but you said there was evidence to... from companies that you've been discussing this with, which I thought was a very fair point. So you must have some evidence. I'm just asking if you could lay it in front of the committee. As I said, convener, I don't think you can give an example of an investment that hasn't happened, but we did get that evidence led to us, both in terms of the Ministry Review Group and uh, submissions from others. Well, could you they felt there the could be a higher level of international support. So if there's submissions that they could be sent to the committee, then I'm happy be to do that. Thank you. And similarly, um, could you uh, furnish the committee, I don't expect today, but uh, in writing with a specific list of the organisations or individuals who said that a central board was the right solution for the structure that you've described? Yeah. We already have published all the submissions, uh, convener. No, but could you send to the committee a specific letter with the specific organisations and bodies who've said that, as Joanne Lamont was asking you earlier on? Uh, well, I, I have mentioned, uh, what I will do is examine whether the minutes of the Ministerial Review Group where this issue was raised uh, can be published, and if we're able to do that, I'm happy to do that and, and publish those. But that will be in addition, of course, to the 329 submissions that we received in our call for evidence. I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm trying not to be awkward here. I'm just asking for a specific list that Joanne Lamont asked for as well of the organisations or individuals who specifically said as part of your consultation there should be a single board. That's all I'm asking for. I'm not asking for minutes. I'm asking for the evidence that helps us to understand the case you're making, Minister. I've heard the question now twice from Tavish Scott. I've given my answer, convener. Thank you very much. So why are we not going to get it, why are we not going to get it then? Well, the, the Cabinet Secretary has answered. Well, respect's not an answer if it says I'm not going to answer the question. Well, it's, it, it gave an answer. So we're not going to get that evidence right. OK, so there is no evidence then. Uh, will the Minister chair this new single board? Sorry? Will the will Minister chair this new single board? Uh, as I've said, that we have a stream of work being undertaken in terms of the governance uh, of that strategic board, so that will be one of the outcomes. We'll decide who's chairing and the membership of that board uh, as a result of the work that we take forward in terms of the governance structure. So it could be a Minister? Well, we won't know that until we've had the, the, the work no, stream that's undertaken. Okay, well, let me ask it the other way. You haven't ruled out a minister chairing the single board. Well, what we've said in the first instance is that the people most involved in this, so the agencies themselves and those on the ministerial review group, should look at this governance structure. They will then report back to the ministerial review group, and we'll look at that at that time. I think that means you haven't ruled out a minister chairing, potentially chairing this board. Um, do you take the view that the UHI regional governance outcome has been positive for the future of the UHI and therefore for skills in the Highlands and Islands? Uh, well, I think I've mentioned in relation to skills, uh, that's kind of out with my area in terms of uh, UHI. Obviously, they, they work into uh, Scottish Funding Council. But I have mentioned already where I think there has been some duplication. That's been said by a number of members of different parties in this parliament. And whether the right balance is there between universities, colleges, local authorities and skills development Scotland is one of the things that we're actively considering in relation to the regionalisation work stream, which I mentioned earlier on. Could you give me an example of that duplication you've just described? 
Uh, well, again, it's uh, sometimes when we have uh, apprenticeships, when we have uh, colleges, sometimes cutting across which uh, the, those activities which SDS are involved in, and we, the, some of the evidence that we had in terms of the um, people which came to the ministerial review group said there was uncertainty in terms of which body was responsible for, for them. So if that feeling is out there, whether or not it's the case, then it's something that we have to address. So you'll have seen not the usual um, cliche of uh, a one-door approach, but um, mention of uh, any-door approach, where people looking to access services for skills, whether it's through local authorities, SDS, uh, or those services funded by the Funding Council, that the people that are trying to access those find it as easy as possible to do so. And then we had that representation made to us both in the ministerial review group and it's in the um, submissions which were made as a result of the call for evidence. Would it be possible to give the committee some specific ex examples of that that were presented to the ministerial review group? I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, do you believe that um, the challenge we have around engineering, maths and science, specifically after yesterday's PISA report, uh, is helped by the narrowing of choice at the curriculum, senior curriculum levels of our secondary schools? Uh, I have to say, Kimia, that wasn't part of the review that we are carrying out in terms of the skills and enterprise companies. But it would be part of the Scottish Funding Council's consideration of the work they do at the well, moment? The Scottish Funding Council's work obviously covers areas substantially out with, as well as included within the scope of this review, but that area was not part of the review. So do, how would a single board therefore address that issue? I've mentioned what I believe would be the strengths of a single board, which I think in relation to uh, the alignment across different agencies to make sure that we can drive out duplication and more effectively focus effort, those things would apply across uh, the activities of the different agencies. But you said that issue hasn't been addressed as part of the schools review, and I take that point. Would it be addressed by a single board? Well, as I've said, I think what the strengths of the single board are, both from those that made representations in favour of it, um, those that spoke uh, uh, for it as well, and uh, the basis of our conclusion are those strengths that will bring a greater focus and will help drive out duplication. Uh, in terms of curriculum, uh, as I've said, we intend, as part of the governance review uh, that flows from phase one, that the protections that should be in place so that ministers don't get involved in directing a, a, a curriculum uh, activities uh, or also have uh, one removed from research and other aspects of university funding, that will be something that will feature in the governance review. So, I, I, And that particular point, uh, as I've said, lay out with the scope of the review that we carried out. So an issue that currently is uh, dealt with by the Funding Council Board, mm. I think you're accepting that it is dealt by the Funding Council Board, uh, we don't know where that issue would then be dealt with because we don't know what's good. It's wasn't considered as no, part I, of the school's I think, you, I, I think education ministers will tell you exactly how they are dealing with that. I'm just saying it's out with the scope of the review that we carried out. But it's it's currently dealt with by a board that you're you're proposing to abolish. Yeah. yeah well, perhaps Paul would want to answer that point. Um, sorry, there is a there was a decision in the first phase of the review to incorporate a look at the learner journey from 15 to 24, um, specifically looking at the pathways and the availability of information to young people in terms of how they navigate their way through education and training. So that will be an integral part of phase two of the review, the undertaking of that learner journey. So will it be considered by a, a, this single board that you want to propose? I mean, the learner journey is part of phase two, but whatever conclusions it comes up with will obviously be referred through to the transition or interim set up that will accompany the... You would at least concede that if Alice Brown and John <coughs> Kent were here today, they'd, they'd answer all these questions because they know the detail of this. They're on the policy of it. It's their responsibility for the policy of it. And what I'm putting to you today is there's no evidence that these issues will be considered by your new board. I've had, uh, I've had a number of uh, discussions with both Alice and John, and of course Alice is on the Ministerial Review Group and is perfectly able to put forward these issues to the extent that she thinks they should form part of what we do now. Uh, we mentioned the governance structure, but also the uh, one of the work streams which Paul has just mentioned, the learner journey, um, which is just exactly what we've been describing, trying to make it as clear as possible for people trying to navigate their way through skills and learning support as they go through the system. So. You know, we have people both from University of Scotland and from the Funding Council on the Ministerial Review Group, and of course those things can be taken into account to the extent they want to uh, mention them. If there's no uh, Scottish Funding Council board, where do things like the capital allocations for um, colleges get sorted out? 
Well, exactly as I've said before, that uh, the governance structure is what will lay out the, the, how these things are dealt with. So we have agreed there'll be the overarching board. What we've not agreed and what is open for discussion and review through the ministerial review group uh, and others is exactly how those things will be allocated. So we have reached that conclusion in favour of an overarching board. We know there are quite a number of subsidiary discussions and um, uh, structural uh, solutions to be found in relation to that, and that will flow from phase two. We're at phase one of the review. We're entering phase two just now. It's not a complete review. Those things are being looked at uh, currently. But it's, you'd accept there's a huge amount of detail, uh, I apologise, convener, um, a huge amount of detail that the Scottish Funding Council Board already deal with, which will have to be replicated by the new super board you're, elect, you're appointing, uh, multiplied by four, because it's four different agencies. Well, actually five, because uh, we're well, creating a new agency, South of Scotland uh, agency. But yes, all, all that data, and that's why the Funding Council, why University Scotland and many others are involved in the Ministerial Review Group to make sure those things are taken into account. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. But I'd like to focus my questions about on, uh, on the Scottish Funding Council. Could you just point to me, uh, what, which page of the Phase 1 report does it recommend that the board of Scottish Funding Council should be dissolved and subsumed by the new super board? I don't have it in front of me, but um, it was mentioned, I made it um, uh, clear in the phase one discussion that took place in Parliament, I made it clear a number of times um, since, so it's quite public knowledge. In the document? Sorry? Is it in the document? Well, you have the advantage on me, you've got the document in front of you. Because on uh, page five, uh, point number one talks about a uh, uh, Scotland-wide statutory board to coordinate the activities of HIE, SE, including SDS and SFC. Do you not think the word coordinates a little bit different to uh, what has now been proposed, which is I say, direct governance of those bodies by the overarching board? Well, I, I don't think direct governance is uh, currently being proposed. The issue of governance is still being discussed as part of phase two. So. You know, we've, so had, is, we've had already a number of um, suggestions from members of the Ministerial Review Group, from members indeed of the agencies themselves, making um, points about the governance review that they'd like, they'd like to see replicated. So um, the governance of these uh, agencies is something which is now... We're only halfway through the review. The second part of the review is still being undertaken, and that will look most crucially, as I've said, at the issues of governance. So, so I'm a bit confused because in, in uh, response to a question from Ian Gray, the Deputy First Minister said that the boards of the Scottish Funding Council and SDS would go and that those functions would be subsumed by the new overarching board. Was he not correct in that statement? Well, as I've said, absolutely right. The boards are going to go. The governance structure which will be brought in instead of that will be decided as part of phase two Sorry. of the review. Sorry, are the boards going or not? I'm, I'm getting very confused I by your I don't know how I can answers. say it more clearly, convener, that boards... For the benefit of Daniel Johnson, the boards are going. I've said that, I think, three times okay. now. I don't know what the ambiguity is, to be honest. But then the document's not clear. Well, I'm telling you now, okay. so I've said it three so times. Can, can you just explain to me um, which experts recommended um, abol abolishing the Scottish Funding Council Board? And was this uh, particular point discussed and agreed upon by the Ministerial Review Group? Well, the purpose of the... It was discussed by the Ministerial Review Group, but no, it wasn't. The Ministerial Review Group was there to make sure that all the stakeholders involved in the sector were able to provide their views. The decisions were taken by ministers. The decision was taken collectively by ministers, and that's our decision. So can you not understand the, the, the concern there is that we had a phase one document which doesn't, didn't make this point explicit, that then in response to a question, it was made explicit um, by the Deputy First Minister, well in advance of the phase two document, which is going to be published, I believe, in, in, in March, um, do you not understand the concerns that people don't really understand what bits are up for consultation and what bits are, are predetermined? You know, I've, I've made it publicly known for a substantial number of weeks now. For example, in the Convention of the Highlands and Islands, again, I asked that specific question, made it very clear. I think all the, all the boards, um, a, well, certainly Highlands and Islands, uh, Skills Development Scotland and Universities Scotland, um, sorry, the Funding Council were all in attendance at that meeting. It's been made plain a number of times in public fora. So, I mean, in recent weeks, this committee has heard essentially the results of a, a wide number of educational reforms. We've heard about um, from Education Scotland who couldn't explain the fall in literacy 
or uh, uh, very poor uh, explanations of, of uh, the, the issues faced by teachers in terms of curricular for excellence. We've heard directly from Ruth Brown who said the issues around uh, the reformed qualifications were in their design, implementation and the way they work. So when it comes to reforming the way our universities work, why should we trust the government given the issues with these fundamental reforms we've had in previous education reforms? And given the controversy, will you commit today to putting uh, these proposals forward in primary legislation so that they can have proper parliamentary scrutiny? I think on the first part of Daniel Johnson's question, that's not the subject of this review. We're not looking to reform universities uh, in this review. That's not part of what we're doing. Uh, and also the, the issues in relation to educational standards, I think will be for education ministers uh, to take up. Uh, on your last point, though, about um, committing to legislation, I would just go back to the point I made before, that the governance structures uh, are being, under, uh, being looked at just now in terms of phase two of the report. The necessity and the nature of any legislative outcome from that will be driven by uh, what those governance decisions are. So you can see a situation, of course, where if there's a need for primary legislation, either for the establishment of the new board uh, or for other subsidiary uh, organisations, then of course it will have to come back to Parliament to legislate for that. But the nature of that legislation will be driven by the nature of the outcomes of the governance review. I don't think that's puzzling at all. I'll tell you what I'm very puzzled by is the, the claim that you can somehow revo reform the, the way our universities are governed and claim that that doesn't constitute a reform of the way of, of our universities. I mean, clearly governance and the way universities operate are absolutely and intimately linked. And further to that, could you point to me what's broken with our university system that needs this level of reform? I mean, my understanding is that our universities produce more um, spin-out companies and receive more competitively um, uh, awarded research funding than any other part of the United Kingdom. So what's broken and you know, what, what, why do they need this reform? Just to repeat, if I could, that we are not seeking to reform universities as part of this review, um, which I think was what you've said, reform of universities, that's not what we're seeking to do. But you have raised the issue of spin-out companies from universities. Now, one of the um, submissions that we heard was about the nature of those spin-outs. Um, and there's been tremendous success, uh, if you think about uh, Edinburgh, Stirling, many at Strathclyde, uh, Aberdeen, many universities have had uh, huge success. There are people in the private sector that sometimes feel that um, the universities will often take too high an equity stake in those companies, which negates their f uh, further growth. Uh, there are questions about um, whether the spin-outs result in scale-ups, whether those companies become more substantial. So these are uh, live questions, which of course are within the domain of economic development, and so we have considered those. What we're not considering is the reform of universities themselves. That was never part of the review. Can you just clarify that point? How on earth can you claim that reforming governance, which is as fundamental as how they're, they're funded, especially around teaching, and claim that that's not a reform of our universities? All I can say is we are not reforming the universities. The agency, the Scottish Funding Council, is part of this review. Universities and the way they're structured is not part of this review. The governance uh, of... Uh, the four agencies, in fact, to become five agencies is what's been looked at in terms of this governance, not the reform of the universities themselves. Uh, my original point on this, as I understand it, the Scottish Funding Council board is going. You've confirmed that. The Scottish Funding Council board is effectively the Scottish Funding Council. Therefore, that is going. To take up Daniel Johnson's point, that will inevitably mean a reform of the funding and governance structures of our universities. There is no other way to answer that. Do you agree that that is a fundamental change? As a, it is a fundamental change. The, this review will result in fundamental changes. And I've said what I've said a number of times now about the Funding Council itself. What is still open, what is to be decided, is the nature of the governance. Now, you will have heard, as I have heard, um, concerns expressed. We've had it at the Ministerial Review Group as well, where the University of Scotland uh, and the Funding Council have said that they have particular concerns that certain things are preserved within that governance structure. So they are going to be intrinsically involved in how we develop the new structure, the governance structure, and it will be designed to protect those things which are very important but, to that sector. But, but Cabinet Secretary, that, that is a massive change of policy, if you don't mind me saying. And I think that you know, when we had the governance review of universities in the last parliament, which created a great deal of controversy, I may say, 
If, that, if there is a proposal for something new, surely that should have parliamentary scrutiny and the government should be able to set out not only what it wants to achieve, but the evidence base to support what it wants to achieve. I can't see that just now. Well, that, that is, we haven't, as I've said, I've just mentioned in relation to the governance structure, we haven't finalised that yet. In fact, we're, we're really in the middle of the consideration of those issues in terms of the governance structure. And of course, when we come to the conclusion of that, then of course, Parliament will have the chance to debate that. It's not for me anyway. Other parties may want to ensure in that. In primary legislation? Sure. Well, I, I think, as I've said before, that the nature of the uh, single uh, board and also some of the other issues will require, are very likely to require legislation, but the exact nature of that won't be obvious until we've concluded in terms of the governance structures. But even in addition to that, phase one of the report was uh, the subject of a statement and a debate in the parliament. Uh, phase two, I would imagine, would also be a statement and also a debate in the parliament, but that would only be a precursor to what is likely to be the full legislative process as we have uh, for other uh, new legislative initiatives. Yeah, thank you, Ross Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, convener. Just first of all, I wanted to pick up um, on a, a question raised by Richard Lockhead, which was around about the comments of um, the former chairman of HIE, um, Professor Jim, Jim Hunter. Um, in that article that Richard Lockhead uh, referred to in the Press and Journal, um, he was quoted as saying that rather than building on the success of HIE, that the Scottish Government have instead, and I'll quote, cut HIE's budget abolished its 10 local enterprise companies and turned the organisation into a Scottish Government delivery, delivery, delivery agency with centralisation, and again I quote, run riot. What is this Cabinet Secretary's response to those particular criticisms? I'd be interested just to hear your, your view on those particular points. And also you'll be aware that the Press and Journal itself is running a, a long-term campaign, which is keep HIE local. I was wondering if the Cabinet Secretary would consider supporting it. Uh, on the first serious point which is raised by uh, Ross Thompson, I think it's, if you start from the position of saying that there have been budget cuts, and I think we all know, I think you especially as a Conservative member will know all about budget cuts, given that the government you support has been responsible for the vast majority of them and the cuts of this Parliament. Uh, so you'll know about the budget cuts. If your position is, as has been expressed there, that there have been budget cuts and what you said about local enterprise uh, boards, and it's a vehicle for centralisation. If that's where you start off, then how can you then go on to say this represents uh, centralisation? We have said we are guaranteeing the continued existence of Highlands and, uh, and Islands uh, Agency, that the Chief Executive will still be there. We have not concluded in terms of the governance of that agency. Um, there will still be the same level of control and discretion and decision making which they currently enjoy. What we are trying to achieve through this, this is my response to the point that you make, is that we think we can achieve more. And in fact, we've had demands for more to be done in all sorts of areas, as, as you'll be aware as well, whether it's increasing job opportunities, the value of those job opportunities, job stability, um, and also increased economic activity. We believe we can achieve more by the work that we're undertaking in the nature of this review. So we think this is a very positive thing for the Highlands and Islands. We think it's building on the best of what's there already and will serve the greater interest of the Highlands and Islands. Okay. Thank you very much, Cabinet. So with all, obviously all due um, respect, we're talking about the political choices of the Scottish Government um, and the areas of holy responsibility that you have, um, and I'm sure the public will see through the blaming of, of anybody else. Um, at last week, um, a public audit committee, uh, Alistair Sim of University of Scotland, uh, during questioning, um, said in relation to the single proposed uh, super board, uh, and again I'll quote him, that a limited number of people sitting around a table will not have the competence to deal with the huge remit that the board could be given. So therefore, Minister, is there a danger that a new single board could be set up to be too big to function, and we would be setting up to fail? I, I don't think it's going to be set up to fail. Whether it's uh, set up uh, is too big to function. I, I think that issue is something that has to be and is being considered as part of the governance review. So the extent to which there is a requirement for additional expertise, um, a additional capacity in relation to that is something that's been looked at just now. And University of Scotland, who Alistair Sim obviously represents, are intrinsically involved in that process. And just to come back to the point you started with, political choices or spending choices are not taken in a vacuum. Uh, the choices that we make in this parliament are intrinsically influenced and directed by the resources which we are provided with. That's why I mentioned the cuts that we've had from successive Conservative governments. 
sure be using the new powers of the Scottish Parliament to, to rectify anything he believes wrong. Um, but thank you, convener, <laughs> on the topic at hand. Um, in the same session, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, Mr Sim um, stated that the role of such a single board again um, should take on an expert view that challenges government, tells it what it has to achieve, has to do to achieve the results that it wants, and also that it has to have the ability to challenge universities as well, because he says that that intermediary role of being able to challenge both ways is incredibly important. Um, in evidence sessions we've had from other agencies, um, particularly Education Scotland, a lot of the submission feedback was concern about an increasing political politicisation of the agency and the inability sometimes of a uh, challenge to be brought uh, to, to government. I mean, what safeguards do you think can be put in place to ensure that we don't see that type of politicisation um, uh, creep into any new, any new board? Well, I think the thing to say is that the performance of these agencies in any event always comes back to political accountability. Ministers are held responsible for the performance of uh, agencies. I think the first two points that you quoted from uh, Al Sim are very good points. The challenge both ways, I think, is extremely important. And that's partly why we've had um, the ministerial review group so we can be challenging our thinking. Uh, it's partly why in the first phase of uh, the review we didn't include the agencies. We wanted it not to be the system representing itself. We wanted to have others that were accessing the system telling us how they found their experience to be. And there were some challenging evidence sessions in relation to that, both for HIE, for uh, Scottish Enterprise and for others. So I think that in terms of how we develop the governance structures, we want to do, uh, just as Alistair Sim has said, is to build in that challenge. Uh, it, it, the actual review itself is responding to a challenge, which is that we've not achieved as much as we have, bearing in mind, as I've mentioned many times in the Chamber, there are two governments involved in the economy of Scotland. The UK government is intrinsically involved as well. You wouldn't think that, of course, from the Conservative response to many economic data that are produced, but they are. So I think having that kind of level of challenge is very important, and that can be reflected in what comes forward as part of the governance review that's been undertaken. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. In, in relation to theme two, convener, I had a couple of questions under that particular theme. Would you like me to ask those? Just no? go ahead. Yeah, okay. um, Cabinet Secretary, in, in the submissions um, to the uh, review, um, I, I noticed that the Scottish Cities Alliance um, had um, given some feedback. Um, and part of their comment was a need to align the Scottish Funding Council uh, funding of further education with regional needs um, of employers um, and obviously as the cabinet secretary will be aware there are particular regional needs particularly in my own area in the, in the northeast where there are skill shortages um, the phase one commentary from the government um, in response to that was that it did not share the view and did not support a regional or local approach C could the cabinet secretary expand on that a bit further uh, well, I, I, if, if what's been talked about is in relation to skills, which you, you mentioned, then I think there is um, scope. Uh, as I've said, we're looking at regionalisation for things to be considered. So I suppose we are, will be considering the view of the best um, dispensation of skills. Uh, one area, for example, Ayrshire, um, I think it is possible to point to, I'd have to see the context of the quote that you've provided there. I think it is possible to see there are specific skills requirements in different parts of the country. Now, if that's what flows from uh, the phase two, and as I say, it's not for me to preempt it, we'll wait to see what comes back from the work streams which are being commissioned. But if that's what flows uh, back from that, then we have an open mind. We've discussed both with COSLA, um, who have obviously an interest in this. They have, including the uh, authorities involved in the city, not all of them, but the Cities Alliance that you've mentioned, a view that they would like um, additional discretion to be involved in these things. I think we have to keep an open mind in relation to that. And as an example of that open mind, I think the uh, announcement that we've made to establish a new south of Scotland um, agency in terms of uh, economic development uh, shows that we are serious about that. Yeah. Um, actually, thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary, because following on um, from that, within the same um, submission, um, the SCA um, proposed sort of decentralisation um, on the principle of subsidiarity. So they talked about um, more fiscal and non-fiscal powers and they put in some suggestions, feeling that local authorities were better placed to incentivise investment, meet local need again if they had that. Um, the Phase 1 report responses, though, seem to suggest strengthening coordination and control through, obviously, a, a national um, board. Um, and actually looking at the responses and the specific ask around about fiscal and non-fiscal freedoms, um, there was actually no comment from um, the Scottish Government. So 
I was just wondering in the same way, would you be as open to those asks as you are uh, to others? Uh, well, this um, ask uh, has been made a number of times by the Scottish Cities Alliance and sometimes from individual members of the uh, Scottish... And, and it's important to understand where that ask comes from. It's the Scottish Cities Alliance. So what I've said to them each time they've made this ask is, well, tell me what powers it is that you don't think you have just now, which are required. I mean, I'm an ex-local authority leader myself. I know the powers that local government has. It has very substantial powers, and it's not clear to me genuinely what powers cities don't currently have that prevent them from doing some of these things. And so I've asked them to provide uh, that kind of evidence, and more than that, to tell me what is intrinsic to cities, because this is not a demand from all local authorities. It may be shared by other local authorities, but it's been made by cities, and they say it's on behalf or in recognition of their particular um, requirements. So I've asked them to demonstrate to me, to provide the evidence, and of course it will be for Kevin Stewart and other ministers to look at this as well, what is specific, intrinsic to cities that requires additional powers? Now, there is one, for example, um, Edinburgh, I think possibly other authorities have talked about a tourist tax, but even that isn't necessarily restricted if it was to be applied to cities. It's possible that other local authorities would have that. So I think what's important to get from both the cities and local authorities is a coherent um, set of requirements that they have, which would apply across local authorities, unless it's the case that cities can specify what's intrinsic to being a city that means that they have to have additional powers. And what is it they need those additional powers for? What specifically do they want to do that they can't currently do? So, again, you're saying you're open to that. If they can provide evidence and suggestions, the government is open to that. And, and I, I, I take your point about um, that the powers of councils, I think a lot of them feel still constrained given you know, there has been an agenda of centralisation. I think they feel that given they contribute the seven cities together, about 65 billion <coughs> uh, to 120 billion that, that Scotland generates in economic output, that that's a significant proportion and that they could, if given more fiscal levers, could potentially uh, meet local need. Um, but if I take it from the cabinet secretary, you are open to that if they were to submit evidence? Uh, well, I think we've said as much to the cities, but I'll just say in terms of the, uh, as you called it, the agenda of centralisation. I know my time as a local authority council goes back substantially before yours, but I remember when a huge chunk, up to 40% of our budget, was determined by ring fence funding directed by central government. That no longer applies. Uh, there's been a substantial amount of decentralisation that's happened over a number of years, which uh, I'm very pleased about. And also beyond that, as I've said, and I'm sure you'll know this from your own experience, local authorities have very substantial powers to act if they choose to do so, specific provisions in law to take action if they want to do that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And just to, to, to make the point, I think those living in the North East in relation to centralisation are obviously not keen on the idea of all the council tax that we raise going to the central belt. That's not very local. Let's <laughs> move on and try and concentrate on the, the skills of you. Hey, Fulton, would you want to come in? Yeah, no, thanks. thanks, Government Secretary, for, um, for attending today. And much of the questions I was going to um, uh, ask you about have actually already been answered. Indeed, I've heard you uh, clarify things sometimes two or three times for members' benefits. I'll, I'll come at a slightly different angle in terms of the, of the board, the new board that's to be set up. Uh, I know we have a phase two, but has any preference um, been given to you, any sort of um, idea of who, who would be likely to chair it? Hey, no, I mean, you've, you've um, seen, I'm sure, and I think, um, I think Tavish Scott, if I'm right, mentioned that there's been public commentary on it, but... Um, I can't think, and I would have to check again in all the submissions uh, or the deliberations of the ministerial review group that people have made a specific uh, recommendation. I don't think there has been, no. And, and forgive me if, uh, if, you've, if you've already covered this, but has a possibility, or do, or do you think it's a possibility, because I know, I know we've, we've got um, the phase two, as, you, as you've said a few times, um, but do you think the, the possibility of some sort of system with the various organisations could chair it? on a sort of rolling basis? And well, one or two um, suggestions already made, not about uh, necessarily the chairing, but about uh, the membership and governance structure. But and when I, whilst I've been happy to receive those and have discussions about them, uh, I do think the driver for this has to be those within the ministerial review group that are specifically being tasked to look at the governance structure. So there have been a number, a very small number, I think maybe two, um, not proposals, but suggestions which are made. But I think it is, 
uh, more proper for the people involved in that, which will not be me directly, uh, the people involved in that to review. So in all likelihood, I would imagine that Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Scottish Funding Council and others. And what we said in terms of the Ministerial Review Group and these work streams which have been established is that nobody should be precluded. If somebody is not uh, within that membership of taking forward that work, work, group, um, work stream forward, they should be able to say, I want to be involved in that. So it's an open process to that extent. But it's best that it flows, the suggestions um, flow uh, from that work. And you wanted to come yeah, on. Uh, specific on the HIE, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this. You said that Inverness, if you looked at Inverness and Dumfries, there was a comparison with Inverness was thriving and perhaps Dumfries said it was struggling and you had recognised that by establishing a, a, a board and understand that that has been a popular decision, that there would be a development board for that area. What do you think um, has contributed to Inverness um, thriving in a way that you suggested Dumfries hadn't? I didn't suggest it. I said that people had said that to us. It was a, um, actually more than one uh, person had said that. So I was saying other people, I think if you check the record, had said that other people had said that to us. But I think there has been a, a, a substantial um, a benefit to Inverness over a number of years. One would be, of course, the establishment as a city itself. Um, the ones which I've uh, more recently been involved in. I, I think the work that's been done previously by John Swinney in relation to the college um, that's there by a number of people going back many years in terms of the building up of the life sciences uh, sector within Inverness and the surrounding area. I think it's had um, a substantial boost from the perspective of, for the first time, um, going to be connected by either dual carriageway or motorway to the other cities of Scotland, which wasn't the case, is not the case just now, but it is in prospect of being the case by, first of all, 2025 and 2030. Um, so I think there's been quite a number of things which have added to its um, its uh, success over recent years. You would obviously accept that the role of HIE has been significant as well. If I can give us an example, I'm the child of a generation of people from the islands who felt they had to come to Glasgow for work. So my classroom was full of people from Islay, Lewis, Harris, wherever, because the islands, in particular in more rural areas, were becoming depopulated. My nephew's generation can contemplate the possibility of staying in their island of Lewis to work. I think many people would recognise the role of the old Highlands and Islands Development Board and now HIE has created that change. And there are still very fragile communities in Highlands and Islands. Would you accept that the, the, the autonomy and authority of HIE, previously Highlands and Islands Development Board, as described by Jim Hunter, was part of that change? I think there's no question that HIE have contributed uh, hugely to that. The point I tried to make earlier on is that many other things have done as well. RET to the Western Isles, I think, was a huge boon to the Western Isles. The in introduction of road equivalent tariff and the substantial reduction in fares, I think, has been a huge boost. It's strategically, also strategically, has it's it been significant? I mean, you can think of individual policies, but I'm asking you, do you accept that that change I describe from the 60s to now was about a strategic role and giving authority at a local level to not just to be committed in economic development, but community regeneration and supporting the skills and development of communities within, the, within these islands and islands. I think I've all acknowledged a number of times now the work of HIE, which evolved, of course, as we're asking it to evolve now, previously from HIDB as well. But it's also the case that if you go to the Western, and I'm sure Joanne Lamont knows this as much as I do, there's been pretty trenchant criticism from the Western Isles about the extent to which HIE had been felt to the centralise as well, and in Inverness. I mean, I had that during the, the referendum campaign when I was um, a, a, a involved in TV programmes. So you've had, that, you've had that criticism there in the past. So um, it's, it's probably as well to say that some of the developments which have contributed to the success of the Highlands and Islands they have come from other sources, but okay. of course there's been a huge role played by HEI. I've acknowledged so, that three or four times I now. cannot think that anybody in the Western Isles who's concerned about concentration of power in Inverness is going to be happy about mm. it being further um, con concentrated in Edinburgh. But I accept what you've said earlier about there'll still be a role for HEI. Can you clarify for me then what the difference is? We're still going to have the chief executive in Inverness. They're still going to have a board. What will be the difference? What will they not be allowed to do? Where would this overarching board, which is definitely going to happen, what would happen if there is a view within HIE that some X should happen? In what circumstances would the overarching board say you can't do that? And if it's only about partnership working, why do you need to create that authority over it in order for that partnership working to take place? 
I think that last point is the key, um, because, uh, to be perfectly honest, as I've tried to be, we don't feel that's happened to the extent that it should have happened up to now, that joint working between different agencies. We think, whether it's in relation to internationalisation or in relation to skills, and the evidence we'd cite for that is the fact that we've not achieved our ambition to move from the third quartile, in terms of the OECD rankings, to the first quartile. We haven't achieved that whether it's in terms of internationalisation, productivity, competitiveness. We've had an increase in uh, productivity in Scotland of around 4 to 5 per cent over the last 10 years, which is not nearly enough. The UK actually has stood still during that time, no increase at all, and yet they still have a higher productivity rate than we do, and most of our competitive countries have got a higher productivity rate than us. So we believe whether it's internationalising, whether it's scaling up companies, whether they're getting more investment in, we can do better. And we think the way to achieve that is to have a greater alignment between the agencies working. And that's what the strategic board is intended to do. But aligning is not the same as overruling, which is clearly with the power that the centralised board would have. We will move on. Julian. Yes. Followed by you. Off the back of what we've just been discussing, um, the five th uh, actions that set out in the phase one report, one of them is an open and international economy. And you mentioned very briefly at the start of, of the session about the Brexit decision. How much has the Brexit decision impacted on the change and creation of this new over overarching board? How uh, important now and how urgent is that now, given the, the, the challenges of, of the Brexit situation, not just for businesses and the economy, but for like, our universities? I think it's extremely urgent, and I think um, it's explained not just by our approach to this review and the uh, conclusion in terms of an overarching board. It's also by other decisions taken, for example, to double the number of SDI staff working across um, the EU and to substantially increase their activity, so the establishment of a board of trade. Um, and it does come down as well to making sure that when we make these representations, we obviously are not in a position where we are allowed to strike uh, trade deals, but we can do a great deal in terms of trade promotion. Now, if you're going to do that, the point I would make, which I'd, I'd sought to make earlier, is that we're best to do that in as organised a way as possible. So, for example, uh, in the last week, the First Minister has announced substantial support for the Chambers of Commerce. That is about their international activities and about ensuring that whether it's ministers, whether it's universities, whether it's SDI, that we do that in as coordinated a way as possible so that we're having the m uh, maximum possible impact. Now, that's important to do in any event, but I think everybody can see how much more important and how immediate it is in terms of the Brexit background to what we're doing. With regard to um, the economic impact that universities could potentially suffer by not being able to access EU funding. How much more important is the links with um, businesses and enterprise agencies that maybe hasn't been as strong as it could be? I know it's been very strong, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Highlands and Islands University have got very, very strong links, but that hasn't really been quite across the board of all Scotland, has it? Well, uh, this, this committee will have had the chance, I think, has been mentioned, to ask the agencies themselves. I think the agencies themselves would concede the point that you've made, that they, there should be greater um, collaboration to do. And there's no question that the university sector sees itself as, by some way, the most vulnerable in terms of the Brexit discussions. Within a week, in, in fact, of the results, uh, I had a meeting with all the chambers of commerce in Scotland and was told by one of the representatives from the North East that they had already lost a contract within one week. It was an Erasmus-related um, contract. And you'll know the vulnerability that universities feel in relation to uh, being able to join um, people from elsewhere is extremely important. So, uh, yes, I think given that context and given the pressure uh, of Brexit, especially in relation to the higher education sector, then that level of collaborative working, and uh, I'm admitting here, I'm conceding the point that it's not been what it should be in the past. I think the agencies would concede that point, and this is a large part of what the review is about. So, so really, the success of, of Highlands and Islands Enterprise in that regard, um, there is an opportunity here with this overarching board to actually share that knowledge and that success so that we can actually take what has been very successful in, in that area and duplicate it across the whole of Scotland. I think it's a very fair point, and one of the proposals which was made, I'm trying to think whether it was just made publicly or whether it was in the um, response, was actually that Highlands and Islands should take responsibility for the south of Scotland. That was a proposal made by a number of people. We didn't think that was right, which is why we didn't decide on that. But you're right to say, I think as Joanne Lamont has mentioned already as well, there's a huge amount within what HIE has done 
which has um, been seen by other areas to be something that is not universal across the board, but much of what they've done has been seen to be very positive, and other areas do believe they can learn from it. And that is, of course, if you're going to have greater alignment between these different agencies, now to be five uh, agencies, everybody can learn more effectively uh, if they're being uh, in a situation where they're working together in a closer way than they have been in the past. I don't think anybody um, should... Um, uh, um, I can't see what the nature of the, the opposition would be to that idea that they should work more effectively together. So they should be more aware of what's going on in, in different agencies so they're not cutting across each other. And also where there's good practice that can be shared across those different agencies. I think that's very important. And it hasn't happened. From the government's point of view, it's not happened to the extent we'd like to have seen it happen. And I think the agencies, by and large, would bear that out as well. Thank you. OK, thank you. Ross Greer. Thanks, Convener. Going back to the Funding Council, Cabinet Secretary, what implications does the government expect there'll be from the abolition of the Funding Council's board on external funding, that from charitable organisations from, from Europe, etc.? Uh, I, I maybe asked Paul Smart to come on this as well, but I think that will come down to what is determined in terms of the governance structure. I think it's one of the issues which is raised by uh, Universities Scotland, and I think there's no interest in the Scottish Government in seeing a reduction in that funding beyond the threat that we already have from Brexit. So I think we're very keen to make sure that doesn't happen. There's also a related issue, which is the, the, the one of classification as well, um, where we have the situation where the ONS seems to take um, pretty much at its word whatever Eurostat says in terms of classification uh, on these matters. So we do have to have regard to that as well. Another issue which has been raised by University of Scotland, but the, the way in which these issues will be dealt with and which University of Scotland and the Funding Council, both the Chair and Chief Executive, uh, being involved is to make sure those, those concerns are reflected in how the governance arrangements are produced, and that will happen as a part of phase two. Taking that on board, and uh, sorry, Mr. Smart, were you looking to come in? Just to add that, that already the um, Scottish Funding Council with the University of Scotland and the Scottish Government have a strategic funding group which is having to consider all the, 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 the funding implications that you've referred to in terms of looking forward in terms of future funding packages for the universities. So that will continue to be the case going forward as well under the auspices of the Scottish Funding Council and the Scottish Government and University of Scotland. Taking on board what you said, would one of the simplest things to do right now in terms of governance that this question already uh, been covered, could we not rule out now that the board uh, would be chaired by a minister? Because that would have pretty significant uh, implications for research funding for at least the perceived independence of the institutions. I've already picked up on concern that funding uh, agreements coming up in the next few months are in jeopardy because of the perception that these institutions will end up not being separate enough from government. Well, to the extent that's true, that's a requirement to get on and do this. I understand that point. But I think it's perfectly possible to see that, uh, and given if you think about, um, probably unfair to mention it, but Alice Brown, and given their experience in public sector reform, I remember hearing her, uh, I'd said this to recently lecturing on this in Brussels a number of years ago, and I went along to the lecture. We have some substantial expertise amongst the people that are looking at this issue just now. I think it's right that we let them do their work rather than announcing ad hoc um, different parts of this governance review. So I think I understand the point you make about the need to get on and do this, um, but I think it's right that we should let those people take this forward in the meantime. I think your point around classification was an important one. If you look at uh, particularly funding from charitable foundations that are based in England, the Wellcome Trust, for example, when this issue came up in Ireland, they were giving universities in Ireland around half of the funding they otherwise usually would because of the classification as public bodies. This makes me question the entire process and the purpose of it, going back to the questions that have been asked previously about why we've even got this far, identifying what the need is in, in the first place. Are we not simply jeopardising the ability of our universities to get this funding to solve a problem no one really seems to have identified? Well, I think we have, um, for our part, uh, believe we have identified a problem. We have to improve our uh, economic performance. Um, I think the evidence shows that we haven't achieved what we set out to achieve. That's not just this government. It has been true of uh, previous governments as well. So I think we do have a need to do that. And in any event, I do think there's a need, as I've said, for that increased alignment and collaboration to take place. But we are seized of the, the, the issue that you, you raise, as are the universities. They are intrinsically involved in this process, and it's not our intention to see a reduction for the reasons that you mentioned in terms of research or support for universities. Thank you. 
Thanks very much. Uh, and the uh, last question is from Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you've been talking about uh, dangers of ONS reclassification. Clearly, it's not something that's desirable. I was looking at the uh, joint submission by the NUS, UCU and University of Scotland, and they say that this the reclassification is under review at present, which is a little bit alarming. Is it actually under review at this point? I think what they may be referring to is uh, the major class classification which happened in recent years was something called ESA 10, which is, as its title suggests, from 2010, even though it was four or five years after it had been developed that the implications of it became clear. So because of Eurostat guidance, then uh, the ONS started to look at ESA 10. I think what they may be referring to as are now further iterations of that classification, um, uh, that cl classification process. So without seeing it in front of me just now. I think that's what they are talking to. I do understand that, um, not least because of the response that there has been to ESA 10 being issued, and bear in mind, ESA 10, if it's developed in, in 2010, and we get told about it, that we have to comply with this in 2015, when we're in the middle of doing, for example, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, that we have to change its classification. Public authorities around Europe couldn't, can't cope with that kind of uncertainty, and I think there's been a a substantial backlash to Eurostat, not least from uh, in Belgium, some of the regional governments here who've had projects which have been cancelled because of that. There's been a substantial backlash. So I understand, and this is just my understanding, that Eurostat perhaps are now acting in a way that's more cognizant of the need of public authorities to be able to plan these things, which may mean that the process of further classification isn't as drastic or as ad hoc as it has been just now. But I think what's been referred to in that submission is the further iterations of that reclassification. OK. The, just a couple of uh, random items, because a great deal of what I've been asking, of course, has been already covered by my colleagues here. Um, I understand that HIE has some sort of social element in terms of their remit. Um, how will that be impacted? Well, as I've said, we intend the HIE, and you're right, that was, um, going back to its formation many years ago, a vital part of what it's done. Um, so, as again, if we say, if, if I rule something out or in just now, then it undermines the work of those that are taking forward the uh, governance and remit structures for um, a, the new board and how it relates to the agencies. But uh, that has been, without question, a very valuable part of what it's done. And it's been our intention to uh, make sure that HIE, um, notwithstanding what we've said in relation to the boards, has the same uh, structure that it has just now. It's got, the, it's got a continuing its own chief executive. It's got a legal status. So I think those things are going to be protected in relation to how we go forward from here. Very much. Well, in that case, that's us. They finished our questioning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. McAloon and Mr. Smart. Uh, and I look forward to hearing you with the information that we requested. Thank you. <coughs> that closes the public session. <coughs>